Yo, 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 what's up all you burner stoners and potheads? This is Weedman420 with the Weedman420 Chronicles. How are all you v v v v vipers doing out there, Mrs. Weedman? Mr. Weedman. How the hell are you? Doing all right. Just all right? Yeah. You're going to be doing better in about a minute. You want to yeah, know why? Because yeah. I'm going to get normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Hey, everybody out there in the Can't world. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you're smoking some big fat doinks while you're listening to the show. And just like Mrs. Wee Man said, we're about to get normal with some biscotti pebbles given to us again by our friends over at Three Trees. We appreciate you guys. Another joint. I enjoy their 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 weed. It's very nice. I do too. Yeah. So this is a rare indica dominant strain, eighty twenty created um, with some different crosses. If you're looking for a classic indica with insanely delicious flavor, you found it. Uh, biscotti pebbles packs everything you want and more in the effects and taste department into each delicious toke, all fueled by a super, a super high uh, with a nice THC level, average between twenty four and twenty five percent. This uh, uh, high comes on with a rush of cerebral effects that launch your mind into pure lifted state of unfocused bliss, Mrs. Weedman. All right. Stay focused. I'll try. <laughs> As your mind I see a smiley face in the in the cherry of the joint. You're high. So that's telling me something. <laughs> <All right. laughs> As your mind settles, a calming body high will wash over your physical form, allowing you to kick back and relax without a care in the world. This high will quickly become giggly and stony, leaving you laughing at anything and everything around you. This ought to be a really fun show. Thanks to these effects and its high THC level, biscotti, biscotti, uh, what did I say, biscotti pebbles um, is often chosen to treat conditions such as chronic stress or anxiety, depression, mood swings, and chronic pain. The bud has an insanely delicious sugary cookie flavor with a rich, spicy exhale. The aroma is earthly herbs, fruits, and notable cookie effects. These buds have a shape like dark olive green nugs with long, dark orange hairs and thick and frosty coating of bright white crystal trichomes. Mm. Uh, I've already done one show already. Uh, usually, Mrs. Weedman and I record a show on one day, and then Big Earl and I record the Grow Hour on one day. And today, we, I had a double dip, <laughs> and I have just got done recording with Big Earl. Uh, on a phenomenal Grow Hour. Will you pass that joint over? Oh, to, so to, you do want it? Uh, oh. What's my name? What's my name? Mr. Weedman. <laughs> there you go. So I, I, uh, I'm I, pulling a double banger tonight, and I'm <clears> excited <throat> because on the last episode, I smoked Nightmare OG, which is a very nice downer strain, but very keeps your mind straight and arrow and thinking clearly and talking clearly. And I'm excited about now being stony baloney with you. All right. <laughs> Good. This is I'm looking forward to it. And as I take a toke of this doink, Ohio... Ohio, waiting on this all day, Ooh. becomes the 24th state to legalize Yay. marijuana for adult ah. use on November 7th, 2023. I've been talking with my friend Jen Yay. over in Ohio who works for a cannabis um, cultivator out there, and we've been texting going, it's going to happen today. And she said, let's go. So and it did. <laughs> so I'm going to smoke to Ohio. Congrats, and all Ohio. all you Ohio players out there. Recreational. Oh, yeah. I'll read the laws in a second. Let me take a hit of this. And then we got to get ready to see the numbers change in Michigan, right? Because people will just stay in Ohio and get their own weed. Yeah, if everything goes right, they don't need to go to Michigan anymore. And what's, what they're doing there is the same thing Michigan is, 12 plants in a private res residence that you can home grow. That's awesome. Retail cannabis products will be taxed at 10%, and sales are anticipated to generate between $276 million to 400 million. Three million in annual cannabis tax dollars by the fifth year of sales. Damn, ten percent. That's it. Ten. Just ten percent. Well, it's probably the probably, state. Yeah. That's going to be the state Munis tax. Municipalities will They'll have probably additional. Throw, but still, only ten percent. Yeah. What did I just read? I mean, I already knew Illinois weed, legal weed, was crazy expensive because of our taxes, especially. Um, but. Uh, what did I just see? That we were like 68% higher on average than our surrounding yes, states? Yes, yes, yes. Like, what? Crazy. 68%. I might want another hit of that, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, it tastes very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, there's going to be probably some provisions because the GOP led Ohio Senate um, and the governor spoke out against the measure. Uh, and the state Senate leader has also expressed his, their desire to revisit provisions of the law and propose legislative changes. So 
Uh, I'm sure there'll be some statutory measures proposed, but the people voted on this, Ohio. Uh, Governor, uh, you're going to be ripped, yeah, Mrs. Ripped. Weed Man. I just keep puffing oil. <laughs> it tastes good. It's nice. um, <coughs> and your constituents of the Senate and your constituents of the House, your people went out and got the votes to get it on the ballot, and the people voted yes. And a big, big win. Like, big. <coughs> so I think you have to respect what your what your people want because I think people are getting really wise to to people in, in politics that you don't listen to your constituents. You just do what you think is what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> right? Rebellion. Straight out rebellion. It's got Mrs. Weed Man right all over. You've been a rebel your whole life. <laughs> a little bit. Fuck the man. I, I walk is what that, I walk that line. Says. <laughs> mm. You walk it. I'm a, I'm a rule follower. As I get older, I'm more of a rule follower. I've always had a line though. Like I'm willing to get in trouble, but I'll let the really bad stuff be somebody else's decision, <laughs> and I'll just stay over here. <laughs> Got to have a little fun though, you know. It's always. And I'm so happy for Ohio. Yeah. Good for you. Congrats. And uh, what what's going on? What are we doing? What are we doing? What did we do? Oh, uh, we week? did yard work. We <laughs> had a beautiful fall weekend. Yes. And we got out in the yard and cleaned up the patio. Mm. It was so depressing putting Put all away of our the furniture yard away. Yard furniture. It's depressing. Cried. I know I hear. A it. lot. And then, the, and then the time changed this Cried. week. And then it was dark. It's getting dark at like 445. It's ridiculous. Like complete dark at 445. Complete. I'm like, I'm like, is it like nine o'clock at night? Yeah. <laughs> it's awful. The dog, the squirrels don't even know what to do. The squirrels the, were when we went out to walk the dog at bedtime last night, ten o'clock, and squirrels were like scraping up and down the trees. It wasn't that late, but it was like it was like seven o'clock, and it it, it was usually, dark. It for was a long dark. Time. Yeah, and they were out running around, not knowing. I never see squirrels out at they night, and they were running around. Uh, Yuki's like really off right now. She's with her looking eating. at her dish at five o'clock. Yeah, like, hey, yeah, it's feeding time. Where's my dinner? <laughs> <laughs> so she's off. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I hope everybody out there. Daylight. The only thing, the only thing good about that day is that you get an extra hour to sleep on Sunday. That's the only thing good about it. Everything after after that blows. It yeah. f- feels like I'm tired. Like not tired, but I'm like I'm ready to go to bed at like eight o'clock. Yeah. And I don't go to bed till one. <laughs> <laughs> but Sunday was nice. We got to sleep in, and the kids came out, and we had a nice yeah hang out at the house day with the kids. Yeah, Mrs. Wee Man, super sweet, cooked a really good. What would you call it? A uh, uh, French toast? It was a baked French toast. Yeah, but it was, it was almost kind like of like bread, bread pudding. Bread, like glor- f- glorified f- bread pudding. It was amazing. And you did it with yeah. blueberry bread. I had a half loaf of blueberry bread and a half loaf of cinnamon bread. It was fucking amazing. It was pretty good. Oh, my God. It was so good. Uh, I ate like three really big, healthy portions of that. And then we had sloppy joes. You made sloppy joes. Oh. And tell them how you do it. Well, next time I'll post. A Why didn't we do time. the barbecue sauce, the infused barbecue sauce I bought? How can we? Oh, because oh, the, the kids, kids don't. Yeah, the kids don't. The kids don't like edibles, and they have to drive an hour yeah. to get back home. We bought some. Oh, I bought some infused barbecue sauce from a vendor at a vendor thing I went to last Thursday at Blue Island Brewery, and uh, Blue Island Beer Company. Beer Company. It's a brewery. <laughs> I correct you it's, every a, time. it's a brewery to me, <laughs> uh, but there was a there was a vendor fair there, and I was hanging out, having a good time. And there was uh, a lot of people that infused stuff. And there was uh, a table. I don't remember their name offhand. I need to get the bottle in front of me. But I got to try all four of the barbecue sauces. Uh, The one that was really hot was too hot for me. I don't like ass burning hot. (laughs) I just don't. I like savory hot, you know. So I don't like when you get that kind of a heat, you know, you can't enjoy the flavors of everything else. I don't like it. That's just me. And and I, I I'm bald, so <laughs> I sweat. <laughs> like if I, I don't have insulation up top, so as soon as I eat something sp- hot, I like spicy, spicy, savory. I don't like ass hot, and uh, I sweat. So like as soon as I taste something that's got a lot of heat, I I the, t- the, whole, <laughs> the whole top, top of, of my head, head is just drenched. Is just drenched. And and the kids when they were younger used to make fun of me because it would just start dripping down the side of my face, mm-hmm. and uh, so I'd have to go get a paper towel and it dry and dab it on the top of my head or sometimes keep it on my head because i'd sweat like and- <laughs> dinners out with spicy food always somehow circled around to like a conversation about how we could make 
like a bald man's uh like a like a bathing cap that it would be shaped like a hairline <laughs> and it would be like a photograph of hair but yeah. it would absorb the sweat while you're eating sweaty the sweaty food oh my or the spicy food i'm really high so my oh boy. but so many uh so many good like like sweatness but anyway what go back to the, bar- the barbecue, barbecue sauce, sauce. so <laughs> Get really back. good vendor. I forgot his name, their name. I apologize, but there was 35 milligrams per 35 milligrams per bottle. And it was 35 bucks. You were getting a dollar milligram for mm-hmm. the bottle. And in the I got this sweet, savory sweet one, which is really it was really tasty. He lets you put some in the, in a little cup and you got to try each one. One I should have bought and I didn't um was the olive oil parmesan infused one. Ooh. That would have been really good to just sprinkle over just some pasta. Yeah. So That'd be good. Uh, but the barbecue sauces were good. I, I'll have to throw his name, uh, their n- name of the company, on the next episode. Um, but so we had sloppy joes. Yeah, we had sloppy. And joes. the way Mrs. Weeman makes her sloppy joes is, you put it. Well, first you got to eat them with ruffle chips. To, you know, do a little couple dabs, and taste it on some ruffles. There's not that this- ruffles are. I forgot how salty they are. I ate almost that whole bag. Yeah, I know. I was looking for them <laughs> today. I was like, Dang, I ate for lunch today. Mr. Weeman ate all there was a little, of the ruffles. Well, there was a little bit of. Uh, there was a little bit of. Uh, I mean, we never finish a bag of chips never, in this house. Never, but it was. They were good. They were good. I haven't good. had ruffles in a while. I think they put extra salt in that bag. I don't know, but they were good. It was I, haven't, really good. I haven't had them in a while. Yeah. And uh, so there was a little bit of the sloppy joes left. So I ate that for lunch today. Ah. And then, uh, but Mrs. Wee Man does her sloppy joes somewhat special. You take those pineapple buns, right? I do the Hawaiian, Hawaiian buns. Hawaiian buns. Why do I call them pineapple buns? Is that what they're they called? Because they come from Hawaii. Oh, maybe. Maybe there's a Hawaiian, Hawaiian buns. pineapple on. Maybe. They're Hawaiian rolls. Hawaiian rolls. And then she puts my, uh, like medium cheddar slices on the bottom. And then she takes her, her sloppy joes, which is already, which is, Got caramelized onion in it first because she caramelizes them in butter and garlic and garlic and seasoning. and seasoning, and then gets them nice and golden. And then throws the the we use chicken, ground chicken, we don't use ground beef. I we do use, beef sometimes, yeah, but, but usually the chicken, ground chicken, and, yeah, it's we a little use ground, healthier, yeah. And uh, and then cooks it in that and then and then chops up pickles and puts that in there because I don't like relish. Mrs. I don't Wiener. put those in when I'm cooking it, no, I, no, I layer at, it, at, yeah, you layer it, yeah. But you would probably prefer. Uh, what's that green stuff? Pickle just, relish. Pickle relish. I'm not a or, fan of it. As my grandma would say, pick a lily. Pick a lily. <laughs> pick a lily. And it was neon green. And I'm not a fan of it. I like pickles. Just straight up pickles. Yeah, I'm so not, I just dice them up. Right. And throw and that throw that at the end. Sprinkle them around the top. And then she layers it on the Hawaiian. More, nope, then there's more cheese. Oh, yeah. And there's more. Well, you layer it first, the, the sloppy joes, and then you put another layer of cheese. Yeah. Right? And then you put the pickle, then you put the Hawaiian bun on top, and then what's the finish and touch? And then I butter the top of the buns and sprinkle on everything bagel oh. seasoning. And then you put. And then I put it in the oven like oh. three seventy five for about ten minutes, so everything gets all melty, ooey gooey. Oh. So this is like fresh, hot sloppy joes right out of the pan, so they're already hot. You just gotta get that cheese to melt, and the buns to kind of brown on top. Mm-hmm. They're fork and knife. You're not eating it with. You could pick them up with your hands, but it's going all oh, in your hand. You're gonna yeah, be wearing you're gonna, it. it. Yeah, you're gonna be. It's not. They're not, <laughs> they're not to pick it's up. Pretty yummy. But to go with a side of ruffles or tater tots. Oh, to scoop up the or Fritos. Um, Fritos. Yeah. Frito. Frito. Sloppy Joe. Fri- nachos fr- are amazing. Freaking amazing. Phenomenal. I, I give you that too. But to, the, something it's about like the, I haven't had. We hadn't had a ruffle in a while. I know. And I couldn't stop eating. We them. were on like a wavy lays thing. Yeah, we you, switched from ruffles to wavy lays. You did, but I, I just but, this uh, is yeah, a good ruffle boy. Whew. My dad was a ruffle guy. <laughs> so, All about I don't the know why you chintzed me out of my ruffle experience. Know. You went wavy for I wavy, went wavy lays for a minute. Wavy I like they're a little more curvy. They are, but they they're, they're, like they're not ripply. as salty. No, not as salty. They're not as crunchy either. No, they're crunchy different. Because they're thinner. We'll probably get a lot of people sending us DMs or messages <laughs> about what's the difference between ruffles and wavy lays. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Either you're either you're a J. If you live in Illinois or Chicago, you're a Jays. Jays potato chips are like like a really like delicate kettle chip. Right. They're they're small and they're very thin, like paper. It's a thin. Chicago thing. They're, they're good. Chicago. They're yeah. good. And there's they're, Jays they're or your Lays. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Or you like the Ruffles. Ruffles. I grew up in a Ruffle house. I had Ruffles. You, know, you had Pepsi houses. You had Coke houses. You had Dorito houses, you had, I don't know. 
in this house, we, we have many things, though, that we like. We just don't like one thing. We like Fringles, or as my dad called them, Fringles or Fringles. Pringles. Pringles. We have, I love the salt and vinegar Pringles. I have a... Salt and vinegar Pringles, top yeah. list. But then I, I love, the, we were talking about this, the, the, cheddar, the cheddar ruffles. Oh, my God, the sour cream and sour cheddar Sour cream and cheddar ruffles, ruffles is something special. Those are amazing. Even the baked ones, the healthy yeah. ones, yeah, those are even they're good, great. too. And then we like the cheesy poofs. Cheesy poofs. The, the, I like the natural cheesy poofs. Right, they're good. Uh, baked ones baked ones yes those are phenomenal and then we we doritos i'm on the sweet on chili the sweet right chili now, doritos, doritos. <laughs> they're they're a game changer <laughs> growing up i always had taco doritos taco doritos are good and you dip them in sour cream you still do that now what are you talking about yeah but then sometimes <laughs> we would mix taco seasoning in the sour cream That's so it was like taco too. taco it's fire yeah and then it was just straight up nacho cheese doritos for a while <laughs> every once in a while you gotta throw in some the cool, cool ranch. ranch yeah but these sweet chili ones i haven't tried them yet they're good they're good yeah yeah they were good in the sour cream i saw you dip oh, them. yeah yeah uh, uh that might have been a little weird i wasn't <laughs> sure about that <laughs> i'd probably like it yeah what you is probably another, would. so i mean we we have a variety of chips that we do eat in this house and and mrs we man especially she goes from chip and then okay She'll not go to that chip for a hot minute and go to it. She just like my cravings change like every yes moment. Yes. And so sometimes when I'm at the store, I'll see something and then I won't buy it. But it puts this little implant in my brain that says you needed those things. You needed that candy <laughs> or you needed that ice cream or you needed those chips. <laughs> so then I find myself back at the store later in the week getting them because, you know, you have a craving. So I'm starting to learn that, like, if that craving speaks just just get the object get that food item have a few bites so we've got like 50 gazillion open bags of chips right now <laughs> chips cookies like i Don't have to learn to buy it, like mini packages of everything you need to buy this not the snack not the like lunch, lunch bags. pack no the lunch pack's not enough <laughs> for you you need a snack bag you need the second size up there's the there's the lunch bag and then there's yeah. the next one up you need that middle ground not the big grab. No, you you don't never finish it. And they get stale. Right. So chip dilemmas, everybody. Oh my chip gosh. dilemmas. But Mrs. Weeman, these are big problems. If you came to our house, oh, it's and you go to the corner of the kitchen. There's two baskets, not just like one basket, <laughs> two, and not, not like not like a bread the, basket, like a they're big like a, baskets, like a box that you might get shipped a large <laughs> object. In. So. so <laughs> There's two. One is filled with candy. Like your KitchenAid would fit in there. A microwave might fit in there. A small, a small microwave. A small microwave. A toaster, a toaster, toaster oven. oven. A toaster <laughs> oven fit would this. fit in there. And yeah. uh, so she has two. One for chips, all different types, pretzels, chips, stuff Crackers. like that. Crackers. Or open, anything yeah, that's open. Anything open. <clears throat> or closed until you're ready to reach for that one. Mm -hmm. And then there's a candy side that has probably, I would say... 22 different types of candies in <laughs> at there. any given time yes <laughs> i really don't go to a store without buying one of those two things and if you are a candy junkie or a chip junkie and you had a craving and you couldn't find these chips i'm sure mrs wee man has them somewhere in this house yeah you should just knock on, <laughs> knock on the door code code word chips chips we need chips <laughs> Oh shit! You ready to get the show started? Yeah, let's do let's it. Let's do this. Why <clears throat> marijuana is stronger than it used to be? Um, this was a good article. Uh, I I'll give you my opinion up front. I mean, I've been smoking weed since for a long time. I mean, my dad was a, was a weed smoker and a weed dealer, so I mean, the weed that he was smoking compared to the weed when he passed away at fifty two was a lot stronger, but different you know i mean to them back then that three four five percent weed they were getting was probably strong to them because that's what their body and their endocannabinoid mm -hmm. system kind of knew you know um so per the cdc the most widely used federally prohibited uh um in the united states is marijuana though it's legal for recreational medical use in all in, in a lot of states in this country in 2020 49 49.6 million people reported using some form of marijuana per shmashma shamsha shmagma sham hush hush sham hsa however aside from its popularity 
uh, it has been associated with increase of potency in the past years. So uh, this is some written papers by the National Library of Medicine about the potency of marijuana in Colorado revealed that between 1995 and 2015, there was a, a huge uh, 20, 212% jump in THC content found in cannabis being sold. Additionally, some products that contain THC, such as edibles and oil, can contain upwards of 95% to 99% uh, THC, despite there being no research to support this amount being beneficial for medical purposes. Basically, most marijuana bought nowadays will give you a much more of a high than marijuana bought in the 70s or even the 90s would. I smoked a lot of good weed in the 90s, though. <laughs> And I was pretty high. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to say that weed was, it's different today. Of course, it's a lot grown. Taste is way better and way different because you're getting it so fresh nowadays, you know. Um, flavor over everything, right? Uh, it is a lot stronger when not imported or compressed. So the history of brick weed, let's just say. Uh, the history of marijuana and how it became stronger over the times goes way back. As reported as this timber cannabis company, marijuana available today is on average 57 to 67% stronger than the samples taken from the 70s. This could possibly be because cannabis no longer needs to be imported as much. In the 70s, cannabis uh, was illegally smuggled in from, from other countries. Along the journey, the flour would be dry out due to being compressed into cannabis bricks, which made it easier to transport large amounts. Uh, let's call that headache weed, uh, to just be exact. Uh, <laughs> factors like that and heat reduce the potency of plant within these marijuana brick bricks, uh, meaning that was most people ended up smoking contained very little THC to actually give you a high. Moreover, a lot more how to get the best out of the marijuana flowers is now known. The, po the most potent type of plant known as sensimilia, which simply means a flower does not produce seeds, is the most commonly grown plant by dispensaries and has the highest levels of THC. That's what is mostly sold today. In contrast, people in the past bought unregulated bags of marijuana and had been grown outdoors and shipped long distances, including the compressed stem seeds and leaves, along with the flower. Um, additional cultivation techniques were grown when growing marijuana are more advanced than ever. We know that we've talked about on a, on a ton of shows. High Times has been talking about this forever uh, since their magazine started. So, I mean, going back into the 70s. So uh, per the University of Bath, Tom Freeman, director of addiction and mental health group at the university, shared, as the strength of cannabis has increased, so too has the number of people entering treatment for cannabis use problems. More Europeans are now entering the treatment because of cannabis than heroin or cocaine. I don't know hope about that, though. Um, so it can still have side effects like uh, stunning IQ growth. That hasn't been proven yet. And affecting uh, athletic performance. That definitely hasn't been proven yet. So... Uh, I have to go through this article with a fine tooth comb because this is what's written. I don't, anything this University of Bath and Tom Freeman, director of addiction and mental group, saying, I don't agree personally, my opinion with his, because a lot of stuff we've read about this is opposite what he's saying at the end of this. Um, so, but also, I do agree with this. Make sure you're getting it for a reliable source and you know where it's coming from because brickweed. And Mrs. Wee Man's seen brickweed, and I've seen plenty of brickweed. Uh, if you had an opportunity to smoke that, <laughs> it wasn't very good. <laughs> it, was, it was downright just brutal. And I've, I, I mean, I've felt it. I've broken it up. I've seen a lot of it. And uh, it's no bueno <laughs> compared to the weed now. So, of course, weed is a lot stronger. You're getting it fresh. Especially if you're home growing it yourself, sure, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. You know where it's coming from. It's going to be a lot better. The quality is going to be better. So, diversity in cannabis has returned. Yeah, at the C-suite levels, uh, it has returned to pre-pandemic levels, actually, uh, according to the study. Uh, diversity among cannabis executives has returned to pre-pandemic levels. At least that's according to a new study, which reports. Um, about 39% of business owners in the industry are women, while some 24% are racial minorities, a step up from 2021 and similar to 2019. Although the study's authors quickly mention a couple of possible explanations for this development, like layoffs, inflation, and consolidation, <clears throat> they stress that their goal was to learn if diversity levels went up, not why. This leaves us with two important questions that even if they can't 
be answered definitively are still worth investigating. What caused so many women and people of color to leave the cannabis C-suite during the pandemic, a time when weed sales soared to an all-time high? And what enabled them to come back in a time when the industry isn't doing so well? Because women and people of color were adversely affected by the pandemic, losing jobs and suffering from a disproportionate number of medical complications, thanks to America's crooked health system, it follows that some of those adverse effects also applied to women and people of color working in cannabis. Think of a black business owner being forced to leave the industry because of COVID-related health complications, or a female executive having to put aside her business to take care of her children. Once out, it's difficult for marginalized individuals to find their way back in. In an opinion piece published in an L.A. Times uh, article, Al Harrington, CEO of the black-owned cannabis brand Viola, discusses a myriad of challenges African-American entrepreneurs are subjected to because of the color of their skin. There's limited access to financial resources, requiring them to use their own cash, and biased interest rates that make it almost impossible for fledging companies to turn a profit. Another explanation for the temporary drop in C-suite diversity, as well as its delayed recovery, may be the inordinate amount of bureaucratic red tape that constricts new cannabis brands. The MJ Biz Daily study highlights the experiences of a number of executives, <clears throat> including Madison Shockley, who, when trying to open the off-the-charts dispensary in Los Angeles, waited a grueling three years before the city finally finished its building and safety inspection. Perhaps the drop in C-suite diversity is a statistical illusion. Perhaps the absolute number of women and people of color executives has remained somewhat consistent while that of white-owned businesses rose, bringing down the former's overall proportion. Between 2019 and 2023, Illinois, Arizona, New Jersey, Montana, and South Dakota have legalized recreational marijuana. As with any other industry, it's often the biggest companies run by the most affluent people that get the first piece of the pie, followed by their smaller, often more diverse competitors. Another part of the equation could be the failure of some social equity initiatives, defined by the U.S. Department of Cannabis Regulation as funding meant to address the disparities in life outcomes for marginalized communities that suffered during the war on drugs. New York, a leader in equity, plans to establish a $200 million financing pool for startup costs and rental properties. Waiting for additional investors, the plan has yet to materialize a delay that has severely stunted the growth of the city's cannabis market. Equity initiatives in other states have been met with greater success. The MJ Biz Daily study spotlights a new coat. Um, her name is spelled K-H-O-T, an Indian immigrant who, after qualifying for the program in Illinois, was able to launch Social Dispensary in suburban Chicago. It has exceeded our expectations, Coat told MJ Biz Daily, which noted that between 25 and 30 of her employees were victims of marijuana arrests and incarcerations. Also spotlighted is Alicia Deals, who became the first black person to open a cannabis store in Arizona after winning the equity lottery. She said it was more than survival of the fittest. Um, she said she struggled, but she was fortunate enough to partner with some big guys that didn't want to take advantage of her. <clears throat> While it's good to see diversity in cannabis on the rise, the industry has a long way to go before it can truly call itself diverse. The war on drugs was devastating for the country's lower class, worsening the very issues it set out to eradicate. It took place during our lifetime and was carried out by politicians we voted for. As such, the state and its constituents have a moral obligation to compensate the victims. Studies like this can help in this effort because they allow us to see how far we have come and how much further we still need to go. Unfortunately, surveys at the state level remain limited, making it harder to paint a comprehensive picture of the nation of the national industry. If only for transparency's sake, closed states should follow the examples set by open ones like Colorado, 
which as of 2021 has been conducting detailed surveys on a yearly basis. As early entrants leaving the cannabis industry and being replaced by a new and very different group of own, our, I'm sorry, our early entrants leaving the cannabis industry and now being replaced by a new and very different group of owners, are there new opportunities for women and people of color? These are some of the questions the study tries to answer, and for good reason. With more information at our disposal, we'll be more informed. Interesting. I because like we it. talked on earlier episodes during COVID mm-hmm. how like much the diversity had changed. It had started off as being pretty diverse here in, in Illinois. <clears throat> there were a lot of minority um, dispensary owners or people getting uh, licenses. And then all of a sudden it became very corporate and well, it that, also took that those changed. Social, they got the licenses, but it also took them a couple of years to get there. To get to get going right to get going and a lot of those licenses weren't released for like two years right so it took them till now you see them in the last 20 last probably 12 months some of them really getting just, kicked off and, and yeah opening along. and yeah. opening more than just one now like some of them have like five six mm-hmm. seven stores now yeah that's great so you know but there were a, a lot there's a very slow process though yeah very slow and it was painful the- to watch and listen and hear though like how long it took them to get their stores open yeah. Whew. And in the meantime, <clears throat> we were watching a lot of executive positions that were female uh, people in those positions. Kind of those numbers were dropping down right. during COVID. Oh, yeah. We were seeing big decreases yeah. in, in females mm-hmm. and minorities. We read a lot of articles. Executive. We read yeah. a, a ton of stuff about it. So it's good to hear that it's yeah, coming back. it's starting to come back. Epic fail. How did we get in this Delta 8, Delta 9, legal, illegal, legal, illegal mess to begin with? That's a good question. So confusing. First and foremost, the 28 Farm Act started the entire Delta 8 journey in America. We've talked about all the different cannabinoids that come from hemp. So, And what came out of the Farm Bill. The significant impact of legalizing hemp on our perception of cannabis lies in how it established the definition of hemp. While hemp and cannabis share the exact botanical origin, the 28 Farm Bill introduced a stringent uh, criteria to differentiate between the two. It set a threshold of 0.3% THC content, designating plants with less than 0.3% THC as legal hemp, and no surpassing this limit as federally illegal cannabis plants. Cannabis... uh, um, .net called the shot before the home run in an article called under 3% THC by net weight just created the biggest loophole in history in in the law history back in August of 2022. The devils was in the details they say with the 2018 farm bill facts cuz don't forget the revote's going to probably happen in 2024. So um so let's talk about the emergence of CBD and then Delta 8. Although we often refer to it simply as THC, the cannabinoid accountable for the psychoactive properties in Delta 9 THC, in 2018, the Farm Bill introduced a plant classification as hemp if it po- possessed less than 0.3% Delta 9 THC. This legislative framework paved the way for the emergence of alternative cannabinoids, including Delta 8, which is the chemical counterpart to Delta 9 THC. Delta 8 THC pr- products are now widely accessible through- across the country. They're referred to as products because Delta-8 occurs naturally in the cannabis plant, but only in small quantities. A chemical conversion process from CBD is employed to produce products with significant Delta-8 THC content. According to the report in New York Times, there was an astonishing 850% increase in Google searches for Delta-8 in the United States between 2020 and 2021. Jeez. However, research of Delta-8 THC remains limited. An early study in 1973 suggests that Delta-8 THC is approximately two-thirds as potent as Delta-9 THC and shares similar effects. Then there's synthetic synthetic cannabinoids, including THCO, have also uh, seen a surge in popularity, mainly uh, uh, attributing to the definition of hemp outlined in 2018 Farm Bill. These cannabinoids are not naturally occurring in the cannabis plant and raise a significant concerns regarding potential adverse effects. In 2022, the California Cannabis Industry Association released a white paper that explored the risk associated with nationwide unregulated market for intoxicating cannabinoids derived from hemp. Tiffany DeVitt, 
one of the reports authors explains you ha you have cannabinoids that the plant naturally produces, and they may be uh, con uh, concentrated during extraction, as seen with THCV, for example. Then some cannabinoids undergo some processing, like delta eight, which typically involves a concentration of CBD followed by the process employing solvents and catalysts for alteration. Finally. There are what I consider fully synthetic cannabinoids, which either do not occur naturally in the plant, like THCO, or exist in such minuscule quantities in the plant, there is, there is insufficient to, uh, toxicology evidence to deem them safe, as they have not been consumed in significant quantities. Um, to clarify, the disparity between partial and full agnostic can be likened to adjusting uh, a dimmer switch to achieve a slight increase or decrease in light intensity rather than toggling it to full brightness or complete darkness when it comes to different cannabinoids. Uh, while THCP is a cannabinoid naturally occurring in, in minute quantities in the plant and therefore not technically synthetic, it functions as an agonist. Research has reported that THCP is 33 times more potent than Delta-9 THC. Now that seeds are legal, what about flowers? A recent development in navigating that its legal hemp landscape is the emergence of THCA. THCA stands as the precursor to THC in its acidic form. To activate THC, in this, uh, you need exposure to heat, typically achieved through smoking or baking. In the context of cannabis, legalizing hemp created an opportunity in the cannabis seed market as seeds are devoid of Delta-9 THC. Similarly, cannabis flowers contain THCA rather than THC. Delta-9. THCA only transforms into THC when subject to decarboxylation process through heat. Consuming a raw cannabis bud, for instance, will not induce a psychoactive effect. If one were to juice cannabis buds and leaves, the resulting substance would be THCA, which has demonstrated health benefits and its anti-inflammatory properties, but does not possess psychoactive qualities. Does that make sense, Mrs. Weedman, finally? Yep. We've read so many times about this. So mm -hmm. the regulatory maneuvering within the <clears throat> hemp industry has extended to include marketing flowers labeled as THCA, and indeed, these flowers primarily consist of the cannabinoid THCA. Before you ignite your joint or bowl, the cannabis you consumed was predominantly THCA. There hasn't been a significant crackdown of the availability of THCA flower, flowers in states lacking a legal cannabis framework although the possibility of such enforcement measures looms on the horizon. Discussions are underway to refine the definition of hemp in the United States, and these efforts fall short. It effectively means that the legalization of hemp has, in effect, legalized all forms of cannabis. This potential outcome holds substantial significance. Get ready for that farm bill, everyone. Talk to your senators. Don't make them fuck it up. So some standards, yes, but don't fuck up that fucking farm bill. <laughs> the Cannabis Community Chronicles. A journey beyond the smoke. That's right. Tell us about it, Mrs. Wee Mayim. Well, in recent years, the perception of cannabis has undergone a remarkable transformation. What was once a stigmatized substance is now being viewed with fresh eyes, recognized for its potential health benefits and economic opportunities. Marijuana dispensaries, long marginalized and hidden in the shadows, are stepping into the light, sharing their experiences, knowledge, and stories. This article delves into the world of cannabis, exploring the diverse facets of this growing community. Cannabis, also known as marijuana, weed, or pot, has a rich history dating back thousands of years. It was used for medicinal, spiritual, and recreational purposes across various cultures. However, in the 20th century, it faced prohibition and widespread demonization. Fast forward to today, and the green renaissance is in full swing. The legalization of cannabis in various parts of the world has sparked a revolution. From California to Canada, nearby marijuana dispensaries are now coming out of the shadows and forming a tight-knit community. It's no longer about secretive deals in dark alleyways. It's about open discussions in well-lit dispensaries and online forums. One remarkable aspect of the cannabis community is its diversity. People from all walks of life with varying backgrounds and beliefs are coming together under the common leaf. Whether you're a medical user seeking relief from chronic pain or a recreational enthusiast looking for a relaxed evening, nearby marijuana dispensaries have a place for you. Cannabis consumption is no longer limited to a specific demographic. It's breaking down barriers and creating connections across generations. Grandparents and millennials alike 
are finding common ground in the shared experience of cannabis. The journey of the cannabis community is not without its challenges, though. Overcoming the stigma has, that has surrounded cannabis for decades is an ongoing battle. But as the community shares its stories and experiences, the world is beginning to understand the positive impact of this plant. Medical marijuana patients have found solace in nearby medical marijuana dispensaries with success stories of pain management, seizure, seizure reduction, and improved quality of life. Entrepreneurs are seizing opportunities in the rapidly growing cannabis industry, creating jobs, and contributing to the economy. The cannabis community is no longer hidden. It's thriving and making a difference. Education is at the forefront of the cannabis community's mission. It's not just about getting high. It's about understanding the plant, its compounds, and its potential benefits. Bud tenders, educators, and activists at nearby marijuana dispensaries are working tirelessly to provide accurate information to both new and experienced users. The community emphasizes responsible consumption, advocating for safety and moderation. They're dispelling myths, clarifying misconceptions, and pushing for evidence-based research. In a world flooded with information, nearby marijuana dispensaries and the cannabis community serve as a reliable source of knowledge. While progress has been made, the battle for cannabis legalization is far from over. In many parts of the world, outdated laws and prejudices still prevent millions from accessing the plant. The cannabis community continues to fight for change, working toward a future where cannabis is not only accepted, but celebrated. In conclusion, the cannabis community's journey beyond the smoke is a testament to the power of community, education, and perseverance. This vibrant and diverse group of individuals is rewriting narratives surrounding cannabis, they're forging a path forward, a brighter, more inclusive future where the benefits of cannabis can be enjoyed by all without fear or stigma. As the cannabis community continues to grow and evolve, it invites everyone to enjoy this exciting journey beyond the smoke. That was a good article. Yeah. The wild, wild west. Oklahoma's marijuana market is about to shrivel. Well, it's been because it didn't go recreational, so they got screwed. So all those businesses that were expecting to do better are falling by the wayside. So come on, Oklahoma, stay strong. We and I mean, there's a lot of bust going on there too. There's a lot of illegal bullshit going too. I know they're trying to clean it up, but the people that live there and been trying to keep their business afloat, you need to change some laws for some businesses there quick. The legal businesses, uh, people put their heart and soul, you know. Uh, mom and pop shops, you know, uh, Wisconsin could nearly see 170 million annually in cannabis revenue under top Democratic senators legalization bill. I just want to read. Uh, I don't. I it's. I hope this passes, but I doubt it. But here's what I liked about this bill. Okay, you can grow 12 plants. <laughs> <laughs> you can home grow 12 plants. Why don't you just legalize that? Let everyone home grow and caregiver program. And just let it go. Then you don't have to worry about all the other bullshit. Give out, you know, I don't know. I think it's better than that. But the 12 plants on this was everything else I don't care about. I mm -hmm. mean, to me, it's it, if it passes the 12 plants, if you're a home grower and you got beautiful soil in Wisconsin, you grow some monsters. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, more about Oklahoma. Severe oversupply and crackdown, too, I forgot to mention. So. A uh, federal judge upholds Virginia's stricter hemp law despite industry opposition. Kansans support marijuana legalization through legis legislative uh, hurdles persist. Uh, Minnesota seeks public input on marijuana industry rules as leg legalization process uh, is pro uh, have some progress. They need to just fucking get it done. Vermont launches pilot project offering child resistance bags for cannabis safety. What else is going on in the world of, of cannabis? Connecticut cannabis landscape evolving quickly. No shortages uh, feared. Good for them. Minnesota begins to uh, rulemaking for cannabis industry, but it's not happening fast enough once again. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Taking some time. Taking too much time. Uh, but the beverage industry in fucking Minnesota is killing it right now. In Minnesota, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Colorado regulators weigh banning uh, marijuana businesses at events. That's fucked up. That's fucked up. You don't. You, are you going to ban uh, alcohol companies to sh to be at events? Then too, 
What's good for the goose is good for the gander, right, Mrs. Wee Man? Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Kansas City dispensary workers win union vote as Missouri's marijuana industry grows, and they're going with the Teamsters. Another just another one going to the Teamsters instead of starting your own union. Come on now. Medical marijuana growers in PA could sell directly to patients under Bill heading the house. This is um, kind of interesting. I'll keep on reading more about it. Massachusetts cannabis firms are shutting down. There's a list. Just take it out online. But there's like 16 licenses no longer in operation from Boston Business's Journal. Ew. Hmm. Why? I just a lot of <clears throat> not making enough money. It's it's a it's a big industry in Boston, but I mean it's all centered around certain cities and stuff. You oh, know? that's right. It's not statewide. Yeah, it is, but there's not just not enough consumers in in other parts. You know, compared to the bigger areas. So. Uh, what else is going on? Thousands of California cultivators call it quits amid wider slowdown. That's sad. That's really sad. Could probably be really good C- growers too. Go to a go to a state that's only medical and start small and grow your business again. Bring your your know how from Cali to somewhere else that you can probably prosper. Uh, Missouri lawmaker calls for an investigation into fraudulent activities in the cannabis program. You think? There's a lot of stuff we, we don't we, that we don't know about. Mrs. Weed Man. Mr. Weed Man. You know a little bit about real estate and home values. Mm, I do, I do. Actually, I should say you know a lot. I might <laughs> I might be a professional in the topic. <laughs> Maybe. I might be. So does weed increase your value of your home? Oh, well, that's what this study has to say. Um, they are saying that legal weed could increase the value of your home. Legalization movements often have opponents. These groups and individuals sometimes argue that cannabis dispensaries bring crime and vandals, lowering home values. But new research from Real Estate Witch shows that theory may not have merit. In fact, 2023 data shows that homes in states with legal cannabis saw a greater increase in home values compared to states without adult use. Real Estate Witch is a publication owned by Clever Real Estate that features real estate advice for home buyers. In partnership with Leafly, Real Estate Witch analyzed home value data in the United States from 2014 to 2023. They used dispensary data from Leafly and home value information from Zillow. The Montley Fool and DISA Global Solutions, a compliance services company, provided U.S. cannabis legalization information. It is worth noting that various factors contribute to home value outside of whether or not cannabis is legal. A lack of available houses for sale can increase pricing, and noise pollution, schools, parks, and crime rates of specific towns can also play a role. Adult-use cannabis is currently legal in 23 states and Washington, D.C. In these states, home values have climbed an average of $185,075 big deal. Those that haven't legalized saw an increase, get this, of $136,092, about a $50,000 swing. Uh, Homes in recreational states have an average cost of $417,625, and that's 41% higher than homes in states without adult-use cannabis programs. Wow. Seven of the top 10 states with the highest increase in home value in 2023, have legal weed, and two, have medical programs. The only state in the top 10 with absolutely no cannabis access is Idaho. Interestingly, most analysis of migration to Idaho in the last few years show that people are moving there from states with legal weed, like California, Arizona, Washington, and Colorado. Strange. Uh, The study lumped medical-only states into the without legal cannabis group. But states with medical cannabis also saw an increase of $29,289 more in home value compared to those without adult use or medical access. The typical cost to buy a house in medical states is 21% higher than states without. Real Estate Witch also revealed that private real estate in cities that have dispensaries is more expensive than cities that opt out of cannabis businesses within their limits. Homes in cities with recreational dispensaries saw a $67,359 increase in property value 
compared to places where dispensaries are banned. Turns out that bolstering creativity and potential medicinal value aren't the only possible benefits of cannabis. Legalization could mean a higher home value, especially for those who live in a city with dispensaries. It looks like voters in states without adult use programs just got more incentive to consider pushing for policy updates. Well, I would challenge some of that data. That's why I gave you the article. Yeah. Uh, Those are really, really big increases, and some of them are natural increases over time, right? Right. All these states have legalized. They were doing this study from 2014 to 2023. Most, we weren't seeing states pop on the map as legal until like 18, 17, 18, 19. I mean, you had the whole West Coast that was done big populations in the west coast yeah you know a lot of homes in the west coast i just coast. think that there's also we've also been on a recovery from the 2008 market crash you would know and so just in general property has increased in value and right. now we're at this like inventory depreciation problem we don't have enough inventory so that's driving prices up even though interest rates are high prices aren't really shifting or adjusting yet um and a lot of talk that they won't So I would say some of these numbers have to do with just the nature of the, the patterns of real estate, but I, there, yeah, I think it's pretty interesting. It's a perspective. It's a way of looking at uh, the, the data. Um, I'm not a data analyst, so I don't know. But you know, know the market, you follow the market pretty heavy. I would say to some degree, these are probably maybe not accurate in the, 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 assumption that that increase in value is all because of it being a legal state or not, but that there is an increased value across the board in legal states. We can dream. That's that's pretty interesting. (laughs) Yeah. International news. Australia okays medical cannabis inhaler for pain relief. Ooh. It's big. It's really big. Like, wow. Like palm hand big. Oh, the inhaler? Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant like big, like that's a big deal. No, it's big. <laughs> it's a big contraption. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Canadian cannabis industry on track for a record number of license exits. Canadian cannabis industry is on pace to see a record number of federal licenses revoked this fiscal year, largely at the request of companies themselves, according to new data from, from Health Canada. The health federal agency revoked 42 licenses during the first six months of the current fiscal year. In 2021, 22, 50 licenses were revoked, more than double the previous year in 2022. The revocations are partially the outcome of highly competitive, oversaturated recreational industry still in search for equilibrium and struggling medical cannabis-focused companies, industry sources say. Man, it's not always, what, bed of roses, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> it sucks. People put, like I said again, people put their heart and soul in something and they build it and it doesn't work out. It sucks because just like, I don't know, I feel bad, especially for the mom and pop shops. Recreational cannabis stores coming to Switzerland as part of an experiment. Hmm. Interesting. Low dose CBD to be legal without a prescription in New Zealand. That's crazy that you have to get a prescription to use CBD in the country. After all, we know about CBD now, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, um, you have, so you don't need a prescription anymore. To be classified, products must contain 150 milligrams of CBD or less per dose and no more than 4.5 grams of CBD per package. Hmm. Well, good luck. Now you just got to get cannabis, THC, and home grow, and you'll be good. Uh, you did a, a, a reading a while back ago that – a lot of people liked it was about set and setting yes and uh this is uh has to do with yoga yeah so um yes set and setting the importance of your atmosphere and your general like environment that you're in and how it can affect your consumption and your experience uh, while you're high well this study is studying the use of yoga and cannabis together And they find that set and setting can influence mental health benefits. A newly published study finds that people who practice yoga after consuming marijuana experience improved mindfulness and mysticality, indicating that set 
setting, I'm sorry, and behavior may play an important role in modulating a person's cannabis experience. You said modulating. <laughs> I did. <laughs> the stu- I feel very clear with this. Weed. It's a good strain. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I feel like I can't sit still. I can't wait to smoke more and go lay down. <laughs> oh, see, I, have, like, I don't think I, that's an indica. Uh, it is so, more of a, so, so it was calm, a, dominant. But yeah. it did say like happy. Happy, and, silly, yeah. euphoric. I feel more of that. Nice. Yeah, it's nice. Good for you. You don't know I like my more uppity ones. Um, the study, published as a University of British Columbia psychology dissertation, aimed to explore the impact of contextual contextual factors during cannabis use on well-being outcomes. As author Sarah Elizabeth Ann Daniels wrote, such considerations are common in the realm of psychedelic therapy, but less so when it comes to cannabis. She says... When using other psychoactive drugs to treat mental health conditions, researchers pay particular attention to contextual factors beyond the direct drug effects, such as the mindset, setting, and behavior, as there is considerable evidence that these factors can significantly impact the therapeutic outcomes, Daniels observed. These factors are really considered during therapeutic cannabis use. The study's results generally indicate that what you do while you experience cannabis effects matters, the paper concludes. Mirroring psychedelics, the study supports the concept that set and setting during cannabis use may significantly impact the therapeutic benefit of the drug. To test whether context affected someone's cannabis experience, Daniels had 47 participants self-administer cannabis twice, one week apart. During one session, they practiced yoga. During the other, they did whatever they'd normally do when high. The most common activities were eating, watching TV or movies, doing housework, socializing, and participating in hobbies. Participants were scored on measures including state mindfulness, mysticality of experience, and state effect. State mindfulness measured both traditional Buddhist and contemporary psychology models of mindfulness including awareness of both mental states and bodily sensations. Mystical experience, meanwhile, referred to feelings of experiencing eternity or the infinite, a sense of peace and tranquility, or loss of one's usual perception of time. Daniels found significant improvements in respondents reported mindfulness when they practice yoga with cannabis. Their mysticality of experience was also greater, even though Daniels acknowledges that mysticality is more traditionally associated with psychedelic substances. While cannabis is not considered a traditional psychedelic, she writes, evidence recently indicates that it shares many commonalities with psychedelic-induced altered states. As for state effect, essentially one's emotion and mood, no significant difference emerged between yoga and non-yoga sessions. Studying the impact of set, setting, and other variables the paper refers to as extra pharmacological factors is crucial to understanding the therapeutic potential of cannabis, Daniels writes. Noting that, accounting such factors helped clarify early research about psychedelics. Much like studies of cannabis today, studies of psychedelics in the 1960s were producing wildly variable results, the report says. Researchers at the time began to explore and document the impact of set and setting on the subjective drug effects and how outcome could be influenced by extra pharmacological factors. Pharmacological. I missed a a part of that word. (laughs) Um, Okay. Well, I got to go back now. And how outcomes could be influenced by extra pharmacological factors became a crucial consideration in studies of the effects of psychedelics and psychedelic psychotherapy. Indeed, once set and setting was attended to, recorded psychedelic experiences shifted from overwhelmingly negative to overwhelmingly positive. 72% of participants said they'd mix cannabis and yoga again. Not only did yoga seem to make their cannabis experience better, but cannabis also seemed to enhance their enjoyment of their yoga practice. The most frequently reported theme was enhanced physical awareness, which captured an increased awareness of the body, movement, and physical sensory experiences. For example, participants reported that they were more in touch 
or in tune with their body and their body's needs and felt their body, sensations, and sense of movement on a deeper level. They particularly emphasized that this was different from their usual experience of yoga, stretching, or physical activity, and that this experience represented a gain or a change from their experiences without cannabis. Six participants had never practiced yoga before, while 30 said they practiced rarely or sometimes, and another 11 said they did yoga often or very often. These findings suggest that paying attention to contextual factors and providing guidelines for therapeutic cannabis users may improve clinical outcomes when using cannabis to support mental health and well-being, Daniels wrote. The results could have implications for how to best tap into cannabis's potential benefits or even avoid potential risks. Physicians have long described a knowledge gap pertaining to best practices when prescribing cannabis for therapeutic purposes, the report says, providing specific behavioral directions as well as psychoeducation on the role of set and setting may stand to maximize benefits and minimize harms of therapeutic cannabis use. Based on the high degree of acceptability of the yoga intervention, yoga or similar mindful movement may be a useful recommendation. Daniels also suggested that the feeling of being high shouldn't be discounted among researchers seeking to understand how cannabis works. A typical trend in the pharmaceutical field when developing medications based off of traditional psychoactive plant medicines is to seek to remove the psychoactive effects. The focus uh, often on the biological mechanism while the high is seen as an undesired side effect, the study says. The results of the current study provide more evidence to support the intrinsic therapeutic value found in the altered states of consciousness occasioned by such psychoactive drugs. The U.S. government itself has named the consciousness-altering potential of psychedelics as one of the major side effects. A $27 million project announced in 2020 by the U.S. Department of Defense's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, for example, was intended to work toward the deployment of pharmaceuticals that work similarly to psychedelics but without significant side effect, including hallucination. <clears throat> Pairing marijuana and yoga, meanwhile, is nothing new in the cannabis community. Classes combining the two have been around since at least the early years of state-level legalization, and likely much longer. But the reported benefits of those activities have been mostly anecdotal. So my suggestion is, this is me, is give it a whirl. Grab a doobie, smoke it up, go do some yoga in a peaceful setting, and see if the effects of cannabis don't add to your practice in a positive way. I'd be surprised if they didn't. I, I like yoga. I do, too. You're good at yoga, though. I like doing yoga, but you're good at it. <laughs> you, was always... you, were getting, you were doing pretty well Yeah, I, when, I you mean, were we, I, when you were doing it regularly. Yeah, when I did it on my own, too. When you, when you, mm -hmm. uh, I do like it. I can remember some of the moves, but I, I don't know why I stopped doing it. <laughs> I think I got <laughs> bored of the person who was teaching it, the free one I was getting on YouTube. Right. And you got to pay if you want, you know, good yoga. Right. You know, um, but it was still nice. It's good. It's different. Mm -hmm. I like it stoned because I don't have to. It's like different than lifting weights because it's more. It's all body movement and I can flow with it. That's why I want to learn Tai Chi. Yeah. But I want to do it high because <laughs> then I can just feel everything around me. Mm hmm. Cause it's the way, you know, it's just the flow, you know, I just, I wish, I wish there was a, uh, I live in the South side of Chicago and there's no Tai Chi anywhere. I think the furthest one is like the nearest one, the nearest one. Yeah. Well, it's the furthest one away. <laughs> <laughs> it's the nearest one. Yeah. It's the nearest one. <laughs> it's pretty far. If there's any, any, uh, Tai Chi, uh, teachers here in the South side of Chicago, DM me at uh, We Man Four Twenty Chronicles Two Point I would love to learn Tai Chi. My mom did Tai Chi in the seventies and early eighties. She did. Yes, what? with a good friend of my dad's, um, and he was a hippy dippy, funny guy that just I, I admired the hell out of him. Every time he he had the 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 long flowy brown hair. He was the cool weed smoker he was the single my dad's really good friend we go to his house and he had you know 
he loved hockey, so we always had hockey games and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But he taught Tai Chi. He taught my mom. Oh, I, you've talked about oh, him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he was a teacher. He was a college teacher, professor, and he also wrote books, too. So, um, And uh, I think he was native. He was native. His family was Native American. His last name was Cobra. Which mm. I thought was even more cooler mm-hmm. <laughs> as a kid, you know. Like when I first met him, you know, I didn't. I went to my mom, like, "Who is that?" She goes, "Oh, that's a long time friend of your dad's." And you know, I was like, "Wow, he's so cool looking!" <laughs> like just because I'd never seen like that. Cal, I grew up in the Bronx, New York, so you didn't see a California looking guy in the Bronx, New York. Even though I don't think he was from California; he was from upstate New York. But he had the coolest last name. I mean, I wanted Cobra. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was pretty cool. So, but. He, yeah, he taught my mom, three of my aunts, Tai Chi, and then he would come over to the house and, and go in the front yard and do Tai Chi, and I was like, <laughs> I thought it was the coolest fucking thing ever, ever, and all I ever want to do is go to my mom to learn how to do it, and they wouldn't take me. I just found you a place, Mr. Weedman. We're in the South Side? Yep. All right, we'll talk about it And you can stop show. in for free class. Free? Yeah. There's no such thing as free. No, one free class. Oh, one free class. All right, maybe out the barter and trade, maybe they'll smoke weed. You should come. You, <laughs> but maybe they do. We could barter and trade. I like maybe, a good barter maybe. and trade. You never know. Uh, but is it, is it a Tai Chi master? He is a Tai Chi master. Really? He is the sixth Dan. I don't know what that means. He's uh, the chief instructor. Oh. Sosi Aikido Kiyokai and a center for the martial arts. I'm excited. The Sosikan Dojo. You're coming with me. We're going to learn Tai Chi. So then we... He learned it in the Marine Corps in 1977. Oh. <laughs> That's not how it is. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's quiet. It's, it's peaceful. breathing. Yes. It's breathing it's a flow. and movement. It's a flow. Yes. I can't wait. All right. We'll have to go. I'm so excited. <laughs> so uh, I, how long have I been talking about Tai Chi? Forever. Forever. Ever. I just pretend that um, I have these very vivid, clear... <laughs> Uh, beliefs that I know self-defense in the form of black belt karate. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> and I seem to think that Nothing. if I am ever in trouble, Nothing. I will just do my Nothing. my you, you karate have, chops you, and I will you have, I'll win. You've never been taught. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, you watch the fucking uh, you watch the uh, Karate Kid five times too many you, times. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the only reason why you know some uh-huh. sort of a stand on the the, the pole with my <laughs> hands out and my foot up. <laughs> I like to thank Three Trees for uh, throwing yeah, us a fucking pre roll. I'm looking forward to finishing the rest of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think we got much left, but I'm looking forward to what we got left. And uh, Mrs. Wee Man, Mr. Wee Man, that's the end of the show. That's it. That's it. I like to uh, say congratulations to Ohio uh, for being the 24th state recreational. Now I can go to your state and finally walk into a dispensary because when I was in Ohio, it was only allowed in the lobby. Now I can go in and check all the fun stuff out. So congratulations, Ohio. We're proud of you. I'm also proud of you that you're doing home grow for 12 plants. Jealous. Jealous. 12 plants, Mrs. Wee Man. That's right. That's a lot of weed. That's a lot of weed. Get growing, people. Get growing. (laughs) Got anything else to say? I'm ready to smoke some more. Yeah, me too. And it's time for a snack. <laughs> Snacks. <laughs> hey, everybody out there in the world, we love you. Be kind to one another, please, man. Just, oh, love one another. Be kind. I posted something that said we'd all get along if we had bongs. <laughs> 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 and that's true. So smoke some weed out there, everybody, and love one another, please. Peace be with you all. As Polly always says, smoke smart. Puff puffing away. Puff puff pow. Check out our cannabis lifestyle brand online at 8decades.com. Our custom smokes and accessories are perfect for your coffee table, bedroom nightstand, or kitchen counter. They're designed for you to show them off. The Canna community is also loving our hemp and cotton blend t shirts, sweatshirts, scarves, and hats, finished off with our 8 Decades logo. We've got some awesome, long lasting goods that will be your favorite for years to come. Eight decades, because a ninth decade of cannabis prohibition isn't acceptable.